Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Underground. Today we're going to continue our book club by taking a look at our latest entry, The 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. Overall, this book examines 33 different techniques for winning conflicts from a more intellectual and psychological standpoint. Each one of these lessons learned is broken down into its own chapter, which uh, is really easily segmented by the different sections within each chapter. So this, this really matters a lot, which we'll get to in a moment. The good news about this book is that even if you're not interested in warfare or stuff like that, a lot of these lessons learned can apply to, say, a corporate world or really anything where uh, conflict, even non-kinetic conflict like social conflict, can come into play. Normally I like to start with talking about the author themselves because usually when it comes to books like this, uh, the author really does matter quite a lot and you have to understand the angle that they're coming at things from. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip over that this time because it doesn't necessarily matter too much with this particular book. This is sort of like an anthology of a lot of other historical books and historical stories. The author's history and personality and experience matters really when it comes to one specific uh, topic, which we'll talk about later. When it comes to how easy this book is to read and the format itself, uh, this book is very easy to read. Uh, it's not like uh, extremely beginner level in some passages. However, this book can be picked up by anybody who has no idea about any kind of military strategy or anything like that. This is directly related to the format choice for this book. I would very strongly recommend picking up a physical copy instead of the ebook versions. Uh, the reason being is that the ebook uh, port didn't really work too well. So uh, the EPUB file that I purchased, let me try to find a, an example here. Uh, the EPUB file that I, that I purchased it did not uh, work so well. For instance, uh, one of the bigger things that you miss with the uh, ebook version and for the audiobook version, you miss this. Uh, are these notes in the margins. So this book, uh, in the printed version, has notes in red uh, on almost every single page. Uh, quotes, historical passages from other books, stuff like that. And also, something that you kind of miss with uh, other formats of the book are these passages here, again in red, that are kind of broke, that kind of break up the book a little bit. Uh, sometimes they'll be in a very unique, uh, let me see, geometric shapes here like this, and it, this does not port over very well to the EPUB file. It, it was so bad that I actually thought that my uh, book was like corrupted or something. So uh, if you are interested in this book, you might want to get the physical version. Also, when it comes to the physical versions, this book is actually kind of hard to find because it has a somewhat common name. There's also, I did not know this until after I had bought this one, but there is an abridged version of this book as well. I can't speak to that one, but I can tell you, and some of the other uh, comments here that we'll get to at the end uh, kind of indicate this as well. This book could have been a lot shorter and kept the same meaning, so if you want to get the abridged version, that would probably be a good idea as well if you're looking for a more short read. Like I mentioned, some of the more general thoughts about this book are that this is definitely worth picking up, but maybe the reasons for doing so might vary depending on who you are and your expertise level. For instance, this book was absolutely geared towards a, a novice, someone who is, has no military experience, but wants to learn some kind of, you know, some of the military experiences and uh, lessons learned from history, which is great. Uh, the book itself, like I mentioned when it comes to the format, uh, is broken up into chapters. Let me just give you a sample here. Uh, it's broken up into chapters in which we have kind of the overview, and moving through, we have the historical examples, a good historical narrative to read through. Um, and then once we get down here, we have interpretation sections. So these sections are kind of uh, an important part of the book. And this is also where things can get very controversial depending on your viewpoint. Basically, the author has the history first and then his interpretation of it and then how it applies to warfare itself. Uh, some chapters have uh, bounced back and forth between uh, historical examples, so it'll go historical example, interpretation, and then another historical example that kind of helps reinforce the first uh, interpretation section. Uh, 
If you have no idea about any of this stuff, the interpretation sections are very helpful. If you do have a history in studying uh, warfare kind of stuff, you might find some of the interpretation uh, passages to be completely off base. So uh, we'll get to that as we go along. But just right up front, I think it's very, very refreshing to have the history separate from the interpretation. So if you wanted to, if you had more experience, you could just use this book as a, as a list of historical examples and kind of ignore the interpretation. Likewise, if you really are kind of new to this sort of thing, you can read the whole book and it would be uh, quite useful for you. So let's go through each chapter very briefly and summarize uh, the kind of contents of each chapter and we'll uh, learn the 33 strategies of war as told by Robert Greene. The first one is to declare war on your enemies and this first chapter kind of sets the tone for the book uh, in that the author is what I would consider to be extremely, extremely aggressive. Uh, the author basically has a take no quarter approach to pretty much every chapter here. Uh, basically be ruthless, be motivated, and let nothing stop you, not even pesky things like morality or social norms or anything like that. This first chapter also kind of highlights something that is a common phrase in military circles, but it's not mentioned in the book, that, not that I found. And that phrase is that battles are usually fought on one square foot of real estate the one square foot of battle space between your ears. Basically, wars are fought on your mind more than any place else. Again, as a slight spoiler, the author not having military experience, he would not have heard this phrase. Uh, or if he did, I guarantee you that would probably be the uh, title of that chapter. But we can see how long-standing military doctrine kind of is interpreted very interestingly uh, as we go along. So. First one, declare war on your enemies. Number two is do not fight the last war. And the author has the subheading of the guerrilla war of the mind strategy. So the author makes the, the point that you should forget everything that happened in the last war and solely begin each war anew. Again, we can start to see, even just from chapter two, that there's there are going to be some criticisms of this kind of ideology. But again, the author is trying to stress the importance of not getting caught up by using antiquated tactics when you've got a new, modern battle space to work within. Moving on to number three, this is more of a psychological thing, as most of the chapters are. Uh, chapter three is, amidst the turmoil of events, do not lose your presence of mind. And the author calls this the counterbalance strategy. Basically, this is don't let your emotions rule over strategy. Don't let shell shock or anything like that, or your lack of experience in combat, don't let that affect your judgment during battle. Again, I think we all can kind of agree that that's probably a generally good thing to do, but again, this is uh, one of those points the author's trying to make that is a lot easier said than done. Number four is create a sense of urgency and desperation. This is the classic case of Cortez burning his ships. Or if you are a fan of Tom Clancy, this is Captain Marco Ramius' letter to Yuri Padorin, right? This is explained in the very famous scene of the movie in which the leader of, uh, in this case, a defection, cites the case of Cortez burning his ships when he reached the New World basically removing all chances of going home, and because of that, it removes the motivation to stop charging forward. In The Hunt for Red October, Marco Ramius does the same thing in effect by sending a letter to his superior stating that he intends to defect. This basically forces the officers on board his ship to go along with his plan, because if they were to return, well, the, the cat's out of the bag now, right? And they would be prosecuted for that. So the author makes the same kind of point in many more words. So that concludes the first part of the book. Uh, this is really just kind of getting started with getting in the right frame of mind for carrying out some kind of warfare campaign or any kind of business strategy, really. Part two is where we start to bring in the team element, because this is touching on organizational or team warfare. So chapter five is to avoid the snares of groupthink. Very self-explanatory idea. Basically, just don't fall into groupthink. 
uh, this chapter mentions uh, my first thought. Uh, I think it does actually mention this, but my first thought when kind of summarizing this chapter is Team of Rivals. The concept of Abraham Lincoln and how he assembled his cabinet full of political enemies, basically. But because they were in the job and now held accountable for their actions, even people who were at each other's throats and not really working as a team were forced to work as a team. The general idea being that people who don't really get along too well and have motivations to work against each other will also help keep each other accountable rather than having just a team of all the same people with the same idea set. Kind of an interesting idea. It's debatable whether or not it worked for Lincoln or not, uh, but this is the, the point the author is making in Chapter 5. Chapter 6 is titled Segment Your Forces. Uh, the author calls this the Controlled Chaos Strategy. And this, I think, is an underrated chapter because this is a very, very powerful idea, and I think that this applies to really the whole book. You could probably have made the entire book on this one idea, and, the, and I think the author may have uh, when it comes to other books. Basically, the whole idea of grand strategy is not really to have some sort of last-minute, complete Hail Mary kind of plan. One of the reasons why Napoleon in particular was considered to be a master of warfare is that he put himself in situations where he had more options than his enemies. That was really all grand strategy is about, to be honest. Putting yourself in situations in which you have options when your enemy does not. We've kind of touched on this indirectly with much of the other content that we've made here, but this is really exemplified in this chapter. The other thing that I thought when reading this chapter is the idea that the insurgent always chooses the engagement. This is one of the advantages that an insurgent force has. The insurgent can choose to engage an enemy force, or they can choose to slip away into the night to fight another day. Classic Viet Cong tactics, right? Whereas the mainstream force, right, the main body of troops of an enemy force has to respond to an engagement. If they get shot at, they are required to return fire, right? That's just kind of how things work out. So being able to use this to your advantage and having a more chaotic battle space, but organized, still organized, but not organized to the point to where your enemy knows what you're doing. This, this is very, very important, and I think the author um, does touch on this quite a lot, but uh, again, putting this together in the context of a modern war is, is very difficult to do. So, moving on to chapter 7, uh, this one I'll refer to the actual text itself. So the title of chapter 7 is Transform Your War Into a Crusade, Morale Strategies. So this, is, this chapter is about uh, improving morale, and I think that uh, this is, again, one of those topics where every lieutenant in West Point has written a paper on this, so uh, I'm not sure if the author has read that or not, or if this is more of just kind of cherry-picking from, from others' work. Uh, so the first uh, idea here is unite your troops around a cause, make them fight for an idea. Uh, step two is keep their bellies full, right? Again, citing Napoleon, uh, which isn't mentioned in this paragraph here, but again, an army marches on its stomach, right? A hungry people will not be inclined to support the people who are keeping them hungry. Step three is lead from the front, classic. Step four is concentrate their chi. Uh, this is kind of a offset again, showing the author's um, unique perspective, which which kind of I kind of appreciate sometimes. Uh, this is again a really, in terms of warfare, an indefinable quality that uh, I'm not really certain how this can apply very well in the real world, instead of just in an ideological space uh, like a book, right? Uh, basically, uh, the author just kind of cuts to the chase here and says, keep your soldiers busy, uh, which, again, is very important. Um, it, keep them going on a sense of purpose, moving in a direction. It, you know, Do not make them wait for the next attack. Propelling them forward will excite them and make them hungry for battle. Yeah, again, that's not... I don't know if that would really be considered to be some kind of ancient philosophical idea or not, but... Anyway, moving on to step five, play to their emotions... Again, starting to get into the kind of moral 
aspects of some of these topics. I I will say, uh, before we go much further, like I sort of touched on in the beginning, I don't think morality and what is right and what is wrong has any place in this book. In the real world, it certainly does. It colors what we do, but it's just ruthlessness is the theme for this whole book. And this is exemplified by number six, which is mix harshness with kindness. Carrot in the stick kind of approach to some degree, but it's really harshly put in the book. Uh, number seven is build the group myth. Again, shared identity, shared culture can start to get into mythical territory. Again, the author is, is most certainly correct in this regard. Build the legend surrounding a military unit, right? And number eight is, again, be ruthless with grumblers, right? Basically, corporal punishment. Uh, don't let any bad morale uh, bring the rest of the unit down. Morale will kill a unit faster than any artillery shell, that's for sure. So, chapter seven is morale tips. I appreciate them, for sure. But, uh, like I mentioned before, if you read a lot more military kind of doctrine, you understand that it's not as simple as this sometimes. So uh, let's move on to chapter eight, which is the first chapter in the third part of the book, which is defensive warfare. Number eight, pick your battles carefully. It kind of makes sense, but one of the the uh, the parts of this chapter that really that I really like uh, is where the author says to make your blows count, but don't wear you out. Basically, you need to strike a balance between effectiveness and wearing yourself out too early on. This, again, is one of those unspoken ideas that can really directly apply to what's going on in the world today, where you want to be effective enough to stop the forces that are doing some really bad things in the world, but you also don't want to burn yourself out too quickly to the point to where you're not really going to be effective when the time comes that you need to be more effective. Striking a balance between combat effectiveness is really, really tricky. And the author doesn't really talk about this too much, but being okay with uh, having less combat effectiveness so that you're able to push forward into the long term it's not really it's not really something that is easily quantifiable in a book. I mean, I guess you probably could if I sat down and thought about it a lot. But basically, how many times in society have you said, look, why is nobody doing anything about this? Why, why are we just sitting around and we're letting this bad stuff happen to our society? Well, it's more complicated than that. But when you're trying to explain it, it sounds like you're a coward. Because you want your people and you want the people that are in your sphere of influence to stay good with their morale. You want them to not look at things like the situation is hopeless, but you also don't want them to go out and do something reckless that's going to get themselves thrown in jail or killed. This is the epitome of pick your battles carefully. In today's society, we want action. We see something bad happening, and we want to immediately counter that with action. The problem being is that we're using the wrong tools for the trade, and the battle space has shifted so much that picking your battles really does look like, or it is perceived to be, acts of cowardice, you know? So this is a very, very important topic that is really hard to talk about, but it's easier to talk about when you've got a, a reference book to point back to. So this can actually directly translate to the next chapter, which is titled Turn the Tables, basically counterattack. Now, what is the entire point of a counterattack in terms of doctrinal warfare? The whole point of a counterattack is to put your opponents into a defensive posture before they have time to think. Someone attacks you, you re-counterattack immediately when they have exhausted their resources, they're tired, they're hungry, they have, they're low on ammunition, and you are now putting them on the back foot. That's the whole point of a counterattack. The author makes the point of a counterattack being basically an, an exercise in disguising aggression, looking weak when you are strong and looking strong when you are weak. Again, Sun Tzu, right? The basics of warfare. This is very, very important because it does play into picking your battles carefully. If you are able to pick your battles carefully, you're able to more effectively counterattack. And especially in this book, Counterattack doesn't necessarily mean a straight-up military objective. It doesn't mean, you know, the trenches of World War I a lot of times. A lot of times the counterattack is information warfare. It is fifth-generation warfare. It is 
cultural warfare. Things that aren't really bullets and bombs and bandages, right? But they're ideas. So being able to counterattack with ideas, being able to counter a narrative immediately as soon as it comes out, is very, very, very effective. Number 10 is all about deterrence. Uh, this is creating a threatening presence. Again, walk softly and carry a big stick. Some of these chapters can be summarized by very famous historical sayings, and you don't really need to go much further, which is uh, that chapter. Chapter 11, same exact thing. Trade space for time. In the military world, this is a very, very common phrase, albeit it's sometimes used incorrectly when it comes to a larger military force. Trading space for time usually refers to something that an insurgent force might do. And aside from being an insurgent kind of idea, this is really Russia's doctrine of warfare. If we go back to some of the more ancient battles that Russia has fought, you let your enemy come way deep into your country where they've overrun their supply lines, they're in a foreign land, and they are far from home. Then you hit them with a counterattack. Now, a lot of times we tend to over-romanticize Russia's ability to do this. For instance, uh, Russia claims this is exactly what they were doing at Stalingrad. They were letting Germany advance all the way to Stalingrad, deep into Russia's territory, before they sprung their surprise attack. It's more complicated than that, and Russia was definitely on the back foot and did not really voluntarily let the, you know, Sixth Army advance all the way to Stalingrad. That wasn't really a voluntary thing. It just happened, right? So they were definitely not, like, springing the trap at first. Uh, but again, that did happen later on. But the bottom line is that trading space for time doesn't necessarily have to refer to geography. It can refer to information as well. Make your enemy go through a lot of effort to get stuff that is not really that valuable to you, but they think it is. But while they're messing around with stuff that's not really that important, you have used that time effectively to carry the fight somewhere else. One of the ideas that I kind of liken this to, at least in the business world, the corporate world, is uh, something that Elon Musk said, and I, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, but he said something to the effect of, if you are innovating at the right pace, your enemies will be copying what you were doing five years ago. So basically, by the time an adversary figures out what you're doing, figures out how to copy your work, figures out how to innovate the same stuff that you've already done, you've already moved on to the next thing. This is the same thing. This is trading space for time. Your enemies are always going to try to use your tactics against you. They're always going to be working against you. But if you are moving at the right pace, and if you are shifting your, your forces to where they need to be, by the time they've figured out what you're doing, you're already onto something else. We can see this with mimetic warfare, if that's the way that we want to talk about this kind of thing. The war being fought in the information space with memes. We all know that the forces that, that be in the world cannot meme. We know this, right? So by the time like an official PSYOPs organization figures out how to make a meme, that meme format is from like two to three years ago, if that. I mean, I think some of the first memes, if you want to call it that, that official PSYOPs units put out were actually like, what, remember the demotivational posters from like the early 2000s? That's what they were putting out in like 2018. Like, no, this is relatable to no one, but, but since their pipeline for approval of any kind of information warfare stuff on the American people is so long, they're having a hard time catching up, whereas memers are putting out memes every 30 seconds throughout the whole day, right? Every day, relentlessly. In the middle of the night, you've got fresh meme templates being dropped. This is exactly what we're talking about, trading space for time. By the time people are trying to figure out how to counter some random meme without, even, without a watermark even being on it, we're already on to the next one. So that's kind of an interesting way to think about this concept of trading space for time. Moving on to part four, we start talking about offensive warfare. And chapter 12 exemplifies the whole chapter, or the whole section really, which is lose battles but win the war. Again, the Viet Cong in a nutshell. Now there have been some historical uh, arguments to this idea that the Viet Cong lost their battles but they won the war. And likewise, the Americans won the battles but lost the war. Uh, there's been some debate to this over history, but... But basically, the idea is to focus on the greater goal. It's okay to keep losing battles because the cumulative effect 
of winning a battle every now and then doesn't directly translate to losing the war, right? If you if you have 10 battles in a war and you lose 8 of them, but you win 2, you might not lose the war because war is not as quantifiable as that. You can't seem you cannot think, well, we're just winning all the time and we're we're constantly winning these battles. And then you get to one day where the airport in Kabul is being overrun. Do you see how this works? There are very few battles throughout Vietnam and throughout Afghanistan that the U.S. actually lost. Uh, if you look at, you know, technically, you've got things like, sure, like the Tet Offensive, that I guess would be considered to be a loss, even though we technically won. I mean, and with Afghanistan, the same thing. Like, I mean, we smoked the Taliban throughout that country for 20 years, and in a couple of months, you know, who was on the back foot then, you know? So the whole idea of losing battles but winning the war is such a very hard concept to, to illustrate. I appreciate the efforts of the author to do so, but it's not something that's going to be really sound biteable into just a nice little nugget of information. Now moving on to chapter 13, this is where uh, I hit my grand disappointment with this book because... Uh, this chapter is on intelligence, and I hate to say it, I really do, but almost this entire chapter is a complete swing and a miss, at least in, in my opinion. Uh, the author seems to think what a lot of people think, and I have not admittedly done a good job at, at kind of explaining this in great depth. Maybe I should. Uh, but the author seems to have a misconception of what intelligence actually is. Like, what's the goal of it? Because the examples that he cites here don't really, they're not really like good intelligence examples. But, you know, without, I don't want to dwell on it too much and just kind of slam the book from this regard because I think that my own personal bias is definitely at play here because this is, you know, kind of my, you know, former life, right? It's my sort of career, I guess. And uh, I just kind of can nitpick this all apart, uh, especially when it comes to the author's uh, interpretation sections. Um, intelligence is very very little about psychology uh, when it comes to what the author's trying to say here. And the author tries to make the idea of, well, just be smarter, be better, be more clever than your enemy. Again, you know, easier said than done. Uh, but intelligence, when it comes to military operations, which is the context the author is talking about here, is not just playing a game of uh, psychological warfare with your enemy. Now, that's some psyop stuff. That's like information warfare, which is not, I mean, it's part of military intelligence, but it's not really the whole goal. Military intelligence is used to drive operations. Find out where the bad guys are, find out what they're doing, find out where they're going to be, and take them out. That's the whole point of military intelligence. It's not to play psychological games with your adversary. That does happen, and that is the romanticized part of military intelligence work, but I guarantee you that, you know, we're talking about Napoleon here again. It's the boring stuff, you know, Napoleon realizing that his ad his adversaries used a lot of baggage carts, whereas his troops, he had carry backpacks to uh, march on foot, right? Whole new kind of warfare for Europe. This kind of thing, this is an intelligence nugget, right, that is very, very valuable, and it actually ends up turning the tide of war. It's not some kind of psychological thing of trying to get inside the enemy's head, though that does happen. I just feel like it's over-romanticized a lot. And how you outwit the enemy is by not sitting, you know, in your room, just kind of brooding about things in some kind of Hollywood cutscene, right? The whole way of outwitting your enemy is a lot of boring data analysis. Uh, it really is, and... That's kind of ignored here. Basically, the author goes to the classic, you know, be a shadow kind of intelligence perspective, and it's just it's just not how things work. But anyway, I don't want to dwell on that one too long uh, because there's other stuff to talk about here. So, 14 is overwhelm resistance with speed and suddenness. Basically, in a single word, this chapter is about Blitzkrieg. The author also does not seem to have heard before the term violence of action, right? If you are caught on the back foot, if you're caught in a defensive posture, overcome adversarial actions by violence of action. What does that mean? It means react suddenly, react decisively, react immediately, and re react overwhelmingly against your force. Even if the 
Uh, odds are not in your favor. The sudden blitzkrieg nature of driving forward into an enemy's position when you know you're supposedly at a disadvantage that can actually help quite a bit. If we're bringing history into this, I don't think it's cited in this particular chapter, but. When we're talking violence of action, uh, really we can think of things like Pickett's Charge from the American Civil War, right? A hopeless assault, an all-out charge on an extremely fortified position that had very little hope of, war of working. However, Robert E. Lee ordered this charge because he thought that the violence of action would actually overcome all of the other factors in this war, right, in this, in this particular battle. Now, again, we know from history this didn't work. Uh, this was kind of a futile effort. However, Robert E. Lee at the time, probably one of the, uh, the most important military minds of the era, did believe it would work, and he was banking on violence of action. Doesn't always work, but when it does, uh, the payoffs can be very, very, very well. It's a very bold move, but uh, violence of action is, is usually what you have left when it comes to things like counterattacks and stuff like that. Chapter 15 is Control the Dynamic. Uh, this is really where... I'm not sure what the author's point is. However, some of the things that he mentions in the chapter are forcing strategies, basically ways to keep the enemy on their heels and to shift the battlefield to your advantage. Now, again, this is easier said than done, and I don't think that decades of military expertise in this regard can really tell you what to do, right? The whole point, what is, the, what is the whole point of military war colleges? What's the point of West Point? What is the point of the Naval Academy? What's the whole idea here? The idea of military academies and the concept of officer training in general really is to train officers and commanders to think for themselves using historical doctrine and pre-establish general theories to aid their own critical thinking and to allow them to be set up for success in a situation that cannot be predicted, right? That's the whole point of this. And I think the author is trying to get at something and solve a problem that, you know, hundreds of years of military academies haven't really been able to do. The whole point of military academies is to, again, train people for the unexpected, and because of that, you have to have a broad view of things. You can't really prepare for each little keyhole engagement you're going to fight. And uh, I think that point kind of gets lost a little bit. Number 16 is shifting uh, tactics quite a bit. Number 16 is hit them where it hurts. Basically, target centers of gravity. And I think that this chapter could have done well with an explanation of what is a center of gravity. When it comes to military doctrine, centers of gravity, that's not just a term that looks really, really good in a term paper. It actually means something quite significant. And the definition changes depending on which nation's doctrine you read. But generally speaking, a center of gravity is exactly like what it seems. It is a point by which all things orbit. It is a central, usually like a location, by which most of an enemy's economy, society, military forces, their whole civilization revolves. Again, usually it's a big city because we first started seeing this idea of attacking centers of gravity come from the Middle Ages, right? Knights in shining armor riding their horses right up to the, to the castle gates, right? Medieval siege warfare is all about attacking a center of gravity. Think about it for a minute. In, you know, feudal Europe, if you've got a you've got a castle sitting in the middle of like a district and you've got the farmland surrounding it, what's the point in attacking the castle when if you've if you just surround the castle and put them under siege, you've got the farmland. Well, it's not about the farmland specifically. It's about attacking the center of gravity, the center of the civilization. That whole society revolves around that one location. And in feudal Europe, it was a castle. Moving forward a little bit to uh, World War One and World War Two era, we've got things like the Maginot Line, right? Where technically speaking, <laughs> you know, the whole uh, idea of you know Hitler going around the Maginot Line instead of you know actually like you know using this whole medieval concept of super fortresses covering each other, right? This is a big topic, of course, is debated very hotly, but. 
the general theory with the Maginot Line is very similar to medieval Europe. You've got big fortresses that can dominate an area, make it really, really hard, so that even if you do advance to past places, uh, even going back to like Fort Vaux in World War One, Fort Vaux and Fort Douaumont in France, they had really dominating views of the French countryside and. As long as they were there, they were going to be a point of enemy contention. So even if you advanced past those forts, those forts behind your enemy, behind your lines, would not be a good thing. This is why the concept of the fortress is very important in warfare. Because even if you advance all the way around it, right, you've still got to go for that center of gravity. This point's not really made in the book, but I thought it was a good way to talk about that kind of thing right now. Chapter 17 is defeat them in detail, basically. Summarized, divide and conquer. Uh, this is also where the author starts talking about things like political unrest, and uh, he sort of dances around the idea, but I read this and immediately thought, okay, this is where the author is trying to talk about getting enemies to fight other enemies. And as soon as that thought hit my brain parts, I immediately thought, oh, okay, this is exactly what's going on in today's world. How many times have you turned on the news or opened up social media and found some group which just appears out of nowhere that appears to target you and your political beliefs? Hmm, really weird. It's almost like someone or something or some much more powerful group is trying to get groups to fight each other so that those groups are not fighting them. This is why I think you see a lot of racial tensions in society today because, yeah, this is a huge debate that will get me canceled if I say the wrong thing, but bottom line is I, I personally think that, look, you know, cultures are different and I think a lot of times when you try to get one culture to, you know, assimilate into another culture, that's just, that's just not going to work. And when you do it, you've got cultural clashes, you know. Look at Europe right now. It's on fire due to, you know, immigration, stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that we can't, like, generally inhabit the same planet without killing each other over it. However, this is the narrative that's being pushed, the us versus them. Well, when someone's pushing the us versus them narrative, you got to wonder, wait a minute, this is coming from somewhere. So, again, that's a very hot-button issue that you know I've really not wanted to talk about a lot. And when I do talk about it, I have to bury it in the bottom of content that nobody ever watches. But anyway, this is a good way to talk about stuff like that is, look, man, if, if somebody's after you, that could be not necessarily cultural differences, but somebody wanting you to take the bait. Again, this doesn't mean that, you know, everything's hunky-dory and everybody gets along, you know, swimmingly. Really, Getting shot at by, you know, gangbangers in a city is not exactly, I don't exactly sit in my car and think, you know what, it's, it's, uh, it's this group that's, you know, their government or whatever that's trying to, to get these people to hate me. You know, when I'm getting shot at, I don't really tend to think about that sort of thing. I tend to think about people shooting at me, so... Um, it's, again, not as simple as I make it out to be, but I thought this is a very interesting way to highlight the fact that, look, man, getting your enemies to fight other enemies is a very valuable battle tactic. We've all heard the phrase, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, what if the friend of your enemy can be turned into the enemy of your enemy, if that makes any sense? If you can get the enemy's allies to fight amongst each other, man, that they're fighting each other instead of you. That's brilliant, right? Hard to do, but very brilliant anyway. Number 18 is expose and attack your opponent's soft flank. Uh, the, the author calls this the turning strategy. Basically, the whole chapter can be boiled down to attack where your adversaries are weak, right? As simple as that. Number 19 is almost the same thing. Uh, it's uh, envelop the enemy, which is sort of the idea of encirclement. Uh, now, the author, this is a chapter I would definitely read in detail because the author talks a lot about the Iran-Contra affair and how that was used by Iran as basically a trap for the U.S. government. And though this definitely can be debated, the author makes a lot of very good points regarding the, uh, the Iranians' kind of ideas of getting the U.S. sucked into this political um, honeypot, basically, and undermining the United States while getting the United States to, to help them out, right? So it's kind of a very interesting uh, little historical little historical note that I think is uh, very interesting. So moving on to chapter 20, we've got 
uh, maneuver them into weakness. Uh, basically, the subtitle is ripening them for the sickle. You know, again, maneuver warfare. This chapter wasn't really needed, but it's in there. Uh, number 21 is negotiate while advancing. This is an important aspect, right? The diplomatic war strategy is what the uh, what the what the author claims it to be. Again, bringing in uh, the ever revered Clausewitz, who most famously said, "War is a continuation of politics by other means." Well, the author kind of dances around this again and basically mentions, "Well, let's bring war by other means as well, not just a physical war, but a war of politics and things like that." So. Again, it's, it's important, but I, I didn't really find it to be that interesting. And number 22 is very important, which is know how to end things. Basically, exit strategy. If you read chapter 22, you will realize that virtually everything the author recommends uh, a force to do is what the U.S. did not do in Vietnam or Afghanistan. So it's just kind of a depressing read because you're like, oh, okay, yeah, good tip. Glad to see that we did not follow that. Uh, basic, ultra basic uh, Fisher Price level military strategy. Um, really great that my uh, tax dollars are going to that sort of thing. And finally, part five. Part five, as soon as I turned to that chapter, I thought, oh man, this is going to be good, and I was a little bit let down. Uh, part five is unconventional warfare, uh, dirty warfare. And the reason that I wanted this this section to be so powerful is because I'm not perfect, and I really do uh, tend to romanticize the concepts of asymmetric warfare, unconventional warfare, the little guy, right? Because I think that deep down, all of us who are, you know, on this rock spinning around the sun, we want to be more powerful than we really are. And in today's age, where the average American feels utterly and completely powerless about the tiniest details in their life, we really do enjoy an underdog story. This is why unconventional warfare seems to be such a hot topic in like the tactical community today, because everybody wants to figure out what's the magic here, what's the secret to being able to use one guy against 500, right? The 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, right? We want to hear these stories and we want to understand why unconventional warfare seems to be so valuable. Sometimes we do it to the point of over-romanticizing it. We think that the only way of warfare is unconventional. I think the war in Europe has kind of proven that's not really the case, but when it comes to the average citizen living in the United States today, the average citizen living in Europe today, we really have to live an unconventional lifestyle that's not that different than unconventional warfare just to survive. And it's sad, I think. Um, it's very stressful, but it's what people feel, and I think that's why unconventional warfare stuff is so popular now. Um, and chapter 23 kind of highlights one of the lesser known parts of unconventional warfare, basically propaganda slash camouflage. Now, again, let me turn to this chapter because, man, I thought, okay, this author has no clue about this. So basically, the author talks about um, the grand military campaign, the grand deception operation, uh, in the lead up to D-Day, which is a classic, classic, uh, classic historical example. However, the author kind of cherry picks when it comes to deception. Now, again, I, I don't want to, to knock this too much uh, because my own kind of, I wouldn't say area of expertise, but I've done a lot of reading, a lot of research, and a lot of work in the field of military deception. And all we have to do is break out our handy-dandy copy of the Battlestaff Handbook to learn that there, it's not just a, the author's kind of cherry picking things here. So, for instance, the author mentions things like the false front, or the decoy attack, or camouflage, or hypnotic patterns. Still don't know what that means. Uh, but the concepts of camouflage and planted information. What the author should have done here is talked about the ideas of ambiguity increasing operations and ambiguity decreasing operations. Planted information is, doctrinally speaking, what we call a ruse. Now, a ruse is not just a, a word you use in uh, a tweet to make yourself sound smarter. It actually means something. A ruse is intended to be an ambiguity decreasing operation. Sometimes. If we're talking about specifically the Haversack ruse, uh, that is definitely an ambiguity decreasing operation. We've all heard the story before. 
because the haversack ruse comes from well it predates world war one I, I think but most of the time we hear it in terms of world war one being fought against the ottoman empire right the british officer or the uh Arab separatist officer, however you want to say it. The, the messenger rides up close to the enemy lines. The enemy shoots at him. The officer on the horseback pretends to drop his map case and rides off back to camp. And, of course, the enemy who saw this whole thing happen goes out there, captures the map case, and lo and behold, the whole plans for the enemy advance is, is contained within this map case. So the whole point of that was to plant that information in that map case to make the enemy more sure, right? They want to decrease ambiguity. We want the enemy to think, aha, I know what they're going to do without a shadow of a doubt now. And the whole thing is based on a ruse, right? It's a whole, it's all just a, a plan. A, a more contemporary, I guess, if you want to call it, example of the Haversack Ruse was the case of Operation Mincemeat, which uh, there's a fantastic book uh, on it by Ben McIntyre if you want to check that one out. But basically, the whole idea is the same, except they took a, a corpse, literally, and handcuffed a uh, briefcase to his wrist, you know, a super top-secret spy briefcase, and flung the body out off the coast of, I think, Spain. And that was supposed to be containing the plans for the whole Operation Husky, which was the uh, Allied invasion of Italy. Again, this is kind of a digression, but it is very, very important to understand that, you know, camouflage is, is can be ambiguity decreasing or ambiguity increasing. Decoys are ambiguity decreasing because we want the enemy to look at our decoy and say, aha, there's the enemy tank. They shoot at it. Now they realize, oh, wait, we've just revealed our own position and now we can target them. So the whole concepts of military deception are very, very complicated, and it's it's, it's just not really done super well uh, in this chapter. But it's okay. It, it's, the, the basics are there. But if you get to this chapter, I would very strong, even if you have no understanding of military operations or you have no desire to learn, really, I would still recommend getting a copy of the Battlestaff Smart Book. Um, you can order that from the Lightning Press directly and <laughs> flip to the chapters on uh, military deception. It's about... I don't know, five or six pages, and it really, really does help you, from a staff officer's perspective, understand what deception's all about. Uh, but anywho, moving on to chapter 24, we get uh, Take the Line of Least Expectation. Again, uh, the whole idea here is to work outside of your enemy's experiences. If you're up against an anti-tank unit, well, maybe not use tanks in the assault. Use something else, or use them in unconventional ways, right? Basically, the author correctly states that you should be crazy like a fox, right? Never really being able to be predictable in what you're trying to do. Again, this, this highlights the whole point of... Uh, counterinsurgency doctrine not really doing any of this. Uh, nothing the United States did uh, was was unpredictable uh, during most of uh, the counterinsurgency wars that we fought over the past century, I guess. But anyway, that's, I guess, a talk for another day. Number 25 is uh, the odd man out in this entire book, which is titled Occupy the Moral High Ground. This chapter directly contradicts everything else in this book in which the author is advocating for being the most evil, ruthless son of a gun that the world has ever seen. And now suddenly in 20, chapter 25, we're supposed to occupy the moral high ground because if our troops realize that they are literally being evil, they're not going to want to fight super well. So again, I, it's, this is contradictory for like some of the other chapters, which are like, you know, like the first, this contradicts the first chapter, uh, you know, in which the author says, you know, be ruthless. Anywho, uh, you know, I think that it's kind of the ruthlessness could probably be toned down a little bit in the book, I think. But um, yeah, it, it, it's, just, it's just kind of the odd man out there. Uh, chapter 26, again, very simple. Now that we're getting to the end of the book, the, these chapters get kind of simple, which is deny them targets. Summed up in a single sentence, don't be there. If the enemy's going to target someplace, don't be there, right? To me, I think of uh, this being linked very strongly to trade space for time because you want to force your adversary to send 65,000 troops to their capital region without you ever actually being there. You know, that's, that was a huge waste of time and it makes them look foolish. Sort of along these same lines, don't be there. Basically, if your enemy is trying to target you in a location, if there is a false flag event or something like that, putting things in our modern context, don't be there. 
Now, this doesn't mean to not do anything. This just means be somewhere else. Number 27 is uh, seem to work for the interests of others while furthering your own. Again, contradictory to literally chapter 25, which says occupy the moral high ground. Now we're trying to play our allies and get our allies to do our dirty work for us. That's what this whole chapter is about. So again, very sneaky, very underhanded. I'm not saying that this doesn't happen and that there's not an element of this. I'm just saying that, you know, there are times in this book where I think, mm, you know, I, 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 the author's not wrong. Um, I just wouldn't go that far. You know, I wouldn't. If this is what we have to do to win, I don't want to win. You know, I thought that quite a lot uh, throughout this book and in this chapter. I think the same. Moving on to chapter 28, we have give your rivals enough rope to hang themselves with. Again, this is very strongly related to, I think, uh, chapter 26 and a few others, uh, to be honest, because it's kind of the whole idea of getting your adversary uh, playing to their ego and making them do something stupid, uh, making them send soldiers here when you are here, uh, making them... Uh, crack down on peaceful protests when all you're going to do is create uh, more dissension. In the whole world of insurgency going way back to Vietnam and way beyond, right? For every insurgent killed, especially in a religious or ethnic war, for every insurgent killed you've created five more, right? So that's the whole idea here is that that kind of thing will lead to victory in the end, you know, maybe, all things considered, right? Things, of course, are not that simple, but this is the idea for this chapter. Make your enemies do something that gets them in trouble in the long run. Sort of a good, good, like, palate cleanser after that is 29, which is take small bites. Basically, slow and steady wins the race. That's the whole point here, right, of, of kind of unconventional warfare is take your time, you've got time on your side, and by the time anyone realizes that you have a lot of power as an insurgent force, you, they've already lost, right? That's the whole point of things. You want your enemy to be just as surprised uh, as anyone else that uh, they're, they're at the gates uh, after years of fighting sort of thing. So, so wrapping things up with the final three chapters here, we've kind of got really quick thoughts because despite the fact that I was really excited to get to these three chapters... It was kind of a letdown when it comes to the interpretation section. So uh, chapter 30 is penetrate their minds. Basically, communications is important, and the power of interpretation of, of communications is important too. Make your enemy question whether or not they heard things right. Um, you can use the concept of communications to confuse, confound, and harass an adversary uh, based on their simple understanding of what you really mean, right? So that's that chapter. Chapter 31 is Destroy From Within. This is the whole um, idea of an inner front strategy. Basically, this is the idea that uh, the author uses in, the, in this chapter, the example of the medieval castle. You know, by the time, and this is a really good thought, like I appreciate this, uh, because the theory is, look, we, we all know about castles and medieval ar architecture and things like that. Uh, and we know what castles do, right? If an enemy force is coming, all the peasants and the you know feudal uh, system basically moves inside to the castle, inside the keep, uh, behind the walls for defense, right? People don't necessarily live in the castle except for, of course, the elite. Uh, but the castle is a point of common defense. It is a center of gravity, right? But here's the point. By the time the actual enemy arrives at your gates, at your city gates, by the time that happens, you've really already lost because at that point, you're not relying on diplomacy. You're not relying on maneuver warfare. You're not relying on uh, allies to come help you out. At that point, you're relying on the physical bricks and stones, the physical architecture of the castle to protect you. You have no diplomatic real ways out. Uh, you have no real uh, defensive capabilities. You're just relying on a fail-safe, which is stone walls. Now, I don't agree with this totally because there are a, a lot of things. Again, castles can be used to trade space for time. Again, a lot of times castles were made so that a, a force could hold up inside the castle, protect their people while other uh, allies come to the aid of the sieging party. Then you can attack from the front 
and attack from the rear and attack from the flanks as well. Usually against an enemy who has sieged your castle, so they're now in hostile land. Again, it's, it doesn't make it doesn't mean that any time you see a castle under siege, that the siege uh, is going to the, 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 that the castle under siege is going to lose, um, which I think the author kind of misses. But this is an interesting idea that you don't want to get to the point to where you're relying on passive measures like physical defenses uh, in order to win. Um, because by that time you're on the back foot, you're on the defense, and it's uh, it's a lot harder to dig yourself out of that hole. Likewise, you could do the same to the enemy and uh, force them to rely on hardware, concrete, ge geography, architecture. They've got to rely on these things because no other tool they have works. Very interesting concept, though. Uh, chapter 32 is Dominate While Seeming to Submit. Again, this chapter, I, I don't know if it was actually in my note here, says uh, passive aggression. That is absolutely the whole summary of that chapter. Passive aggression, uh, undermining, uh, non-committal attitudes, uh, pretending to be stupid, stuff like that. All of this kind of things, the passive uh, ways of resisting, that's an effective warfare tactic. I mean, it has worked quite well, even if it's not really... Uh, satisfying and it really can hurt your morale uh, in the long term but hey you know it's in the book and it's definitely a valid uh, addition for sure in chapter 33 perhaps the most exciting yet underwhelming chapter is so uncertainty and panic through acts of terror basically the bottom line is terrorism works because well it just works uh, there's a lot of ways that you can use terrorism as a tool to get what you want. Um, the author and myself, I guess, doesn't really go into detail uh, regarding the why and specific, you know, terrorism kind of ideas, probably for legal reasons, but, you know, in today's, in today's climate, this book was published not that long ago, so yeah, there would still be the sort of censorship and legal concerns, I guess. Uh, but yeah, chapter 33 is basically terrorism. Um, and uh, that can kind of apply to pretty much every chapter, I think, so far. So that pretty much wraps us up. Uh, one thing that I did want to kind of note is that one of the things that I love to do, usually even before beginning to read a book, I will flip all the way to the back and I will look at the selected bibliography and see if there are any really good... Um, really good like books that you can read as well or like see where the author is coming from and this this one's um quite quite short i think considering how long this book is and how many sources were cited it there's i don't know a couple of dozen sources i would expect several pages of sources but this is what you get um and uh yeah it, it's it's some classics carl von clausewitz uh frederick douglas uh shelby foot of course Henry Kissinger, T. E. Lawrence. These are the kinds of uh, people that are being uh, cited by the author here. Sun Tzu, of course, Friedrich Nietzsche. Oh, John Poole. You don't really see John Poole being quoted that much because his books are really, really unique and interesting. I'll just put it that. Uh, very controversial. Very, very controversial author uh, when it comes to military doctrine. But, I mean, I've got all of his books, and I think they're all kind of very interesting to read. Uh, Sun Tzu, of course, uh, because most of this book is is basically talking about Sun Tzu's concepts. So, you know, I feel like generally speaking, the author is definitely on the right track, and I and I don't want to to lay a lot of criticism on this book because it it, it I don't think it deserves it. Um, it deserve every book deserves criticism because a book that is not going to be criticized is is uh, probably not living up to the expectation that it should be, right? You know, we, we should criticize each other's work in hopes of increasing it and increasing our own knowledge and, you know, just being better all around, right? I think that this author, I, like I wrote on uh, Patreon, I think that uh, this book would be akin, very similar to Nate Fick's book, Nathaniel Fick, uh, who wrote uh, One Bullet Away, a very legendary book, uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, basically lessons learned during mostly Iraq and Afghanistan as well. If Nate Fick had never deployed overseas, I think this book would look just like that. Um, this book kind of uh, feels like this book would have been so much more powerful if the author had maybe interviewed some troops, had, had maybe interviewed some commanders, or even maybe just read their books, because there aren't really any 
biographies uh, that I could see that are uh, kind of leaned on so much as, as like ancient warfare kind of stuff. So nothing really modern, which is strange, um, even though we have a lot more sources for modern stuff. So before I get off track too far, let me uh, bring up some comments from Patreon here. And uh, some of you have gotten really good, concise ways of talking about some of these ideas than I have for sure. So uh, so TK233 uh, says, I listened to the audiobook as well, and the delivery definitely helps you overlook some of the nuances that you picked up, like switching from passive to direct. Overall, I did get the Sun Tzu feel, but I liked the way that it was broken down. It also felt a little like Wisdom of the Bullfrog by Admiral McRaven, retired in, in its delivery. I'll definitely pick up a physical copy to add to my reference library, though. So yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one of the things in this book that I forgot to mention early on is the tense shift, or, or uh, the voice shift. So, for instance... When you get to, uh, say, starting a chapter and you read the historical uh, portions, the historical portions are perfect. They, they read like any history book, you know, maybe just a little easier to read. Great. Fantastic. But when you get to the interpretation sections, the author switches the voice a lot of times. And the interpretation sections read like a self-help book. They are directly addressing the reader the words you should and you must and things like that. Directly addressing the reader, that's all in the interpretation sections, which is kind of frustrating for me. It might not be a big issue for some. I'm sure, like um, like you mentioned here, if you if you listen to the audiobook, you probably wouldn't notice it. But I, I noticed it kind of early on, and it was... Um, I don't know. It, it, it was kind of annoying, but, uh, you know, it might not bother you. I feel like you probably wouldn't have noticed it unless I said something. So sorry, <laughs> but, um, yeah, interesting. And again, like I mentioned, uh, I mentioned in the, the kind of text review I did of this, the, um, it, it feels in some places like the later chapters where we really get to kind of the exciting, you know, meaty topics. It feels like the author just kind of read Sun Tzu and just is like, well, Here's my interpretation of probably the most interpreted book on warfare ever written, right? So some of the ideas feel kind of cheap. You know, it feels like, okay, we needed 33 strategies of war and not 27 strategies of war. So we needed 33 for some reason. Uh, you could have boiled all these down to just 10. I think 10 probably would have been a nice round number anyway. But uh, yeah, you could have boiled all this down. But again, for those of you, this is again personal preference. So... Uh, don't think that this just means the book is bad. If you prefer to read things like this, this is, you know, this is your uh, bread and butter, I guess. But for me, I don't know. It just, it, it the interpretation sections, uh, I didn't really value too much. And uh, let me bring up another comment here. Uh, Saber writes a long comment, but I think that this is worth it because it kind of helps make my point. Uh, he writes that, I appreciated this book overall, but I found myself paying more attention to the historical examples and quotes more than the interpretation sections. In fact, towards the end of the book, I skipped these sections because they weren't delivering new or detailed information. I think this book could have been a lot shorter, especially since the unconventional warfare section was essentially just Green saying, quote, you know, be a deceitful jerk over and over again in slightly different words each chapter. Many of these strategies are questionable, even counterproductive in, in the everyday life environment he seems to be targeting. But I think that that's because he broke larger, more coherent strategies down into small pieces and wrapped them in a civilian context. Great for padding and storytelling, but doesn't work very well as a blueprint for strategy. I still really enjoyed the book, especially the info about actual battles and the critical thinking the commanders did to win. Yeah, I completely agree with this. This is a great, um, concise way of wrapping things up. If you're looking to purchase a book that is a how-to guide for dummies on how to win a war, this is not it. But if you wanted an introduction on maybe thinking about stuff like that, this is a pretty good book to start with. I think that you, in terms of if you have never heard about grand strategy, you've never heard about military strategy, and you want to learn something about it, this book is probably one of the best there is for starting. Uh, however, like I, I kind of wrote in my, um, my text review here, you'll probably outgrow some of these ideas once you realize, hey, you know, Green is just one guy, and he's making a point based on cherry-picking information, which... Which is fine, but that's not doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is a shared uh, series of ideas between a group of people that have been war games between each other. Like, we don't just 
put something in a military manual because one you know colonel said, hey, I think this is a good idea. Put it in the book. No, it doesn't work like that. In the civilian world, that's how it works, though. Um, so this book really does highlight that you know things are not really as simple. And uh, one of the comments that we have from Daniel here kind of highlights that as well. Uh, he's quoting me when he says, nothing is as cut and dry as suggested in the book. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I noticed he overused absolute terms like always and never. I'm just a civilian with no military experience, but even I know that there are very few absolutes when it comes to strategy. This is certainly very true, right? Only the Sith deal in absolutes, right? It's the same kind of idea with warfare, right? You never really want to put the words never in something. It really makes me kind of think, hmm, you know, maybe this isn't such uh, great advice here. But anyway, this is um, quite important, I think. But again, maybe I'm just being rambly and too, uh, too overly critical of this book, I think. Um, so let me wrap up with one final uh, comment here from Air Mac, uh, who says, While this book did help give me some good ideas on war strategy, it gave me a better idea on how to deal with people in everyday life. Like you mentioned in your review, the book uses a lot of psychology when explaining things. This book should have been titled The Psychology of War. I agree with that. Yeah, this book is, is you know, unfortunately, I think the author, you know, I wrote about this as being kind of a downside that the author uh, seems to have a psychological answer for everything. You know, like uh, your troops are um, uh, running low on logistics. Well, okay, psychology is the answer. Uh, we just need to improve the morale. Well, you know, it's not as simple as that. Psychology is not the answer. And I feel like sometimes the author uses psychology as kind of like the hammer and the nail thing. If psychology is all you've got to lean on as an author, then psychology, psychological tricks and, and mind games will be the only solutions that you have. So that tends to come across a little bit in the book, but again, I do appreciate this. You know, I really do because this is one of the only books on military doctrine that is not written by a military officer and not written for a military audience. So this book is very special in that regard and I want to kind of stress that, you know, a lot that these kinds of books are exactly what I'm looking for. Because, you know, sometimes I don't want to really read about military doctrine that's existed for how long, so long that groupthink has taken over, and now we've got something that's not true being repeated, right? How many times have we lost a war because of that, right? What did Green say in the beginning? Don't fight the, don't fight the last war, right? And I feel like a lot of times military doctrine is, is doing just that. So getting things from a civilian perspective is very, very valuable. Uh, so again, this is why I would, I would very much recommend this book. Uh, get the physical copy like I mentioned. Take a look at it. Uh, you, you probably won't use the interpretation section so much, but again, it's it's a good way to in, to increase your thinking. And even if you are, uh, you know, well read on military strategy, this book is very helpful because, uh, for instance, I wrote in my review like, look, if you're trying to write a term paper on a battle, this is your book uh, because you can just flip to the battles. You can use uh, page markers to to uh, keep track of when the author is jumping between eras. So if the author is talking about, you know, Falkland Islands, this is this chapter. If you're, you know, the author's talking about Napoleon, you know, here are all the chapters that cite Napoleon. Uh, that would be pretty cool. I think you'd be able to write a, a, a term paper really easily using this book. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little tidbit if you're uh, into research papers and stuff like that. So yeah, I think, I think we'll wrap things up there. I think I've talked, uh, talked this one to death. So so thank you all again for your participation. I'm really, really enjoying this uh, book club so far. I really think this is kind of helping us a lot. Um, not all the books that we pick are going to be winners. Uh, there, there are going to be some that aren't going to be too great. But I really do like the fact this is kind of holding us all to a, a common standard. And we're able to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. And I really do appreciate that because uh, it sounds like it's not that valuable, but it really does kind of help things. Uh, and especially if you're trying to do one book a month, that really helps things out as well. So thank you again for watching, everyone. Thanks for your participation, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.